Good evening, everyone, and welcome to BT's Fly Tying Friday. Tonight, the 1st of December, 2023, we're going to be doing some demonstrating for you instead of a guest presenter. We've got a new pattern and a couple of old patterns. And the weekly tip is actually the, the new fly that we've been working on designing for the better part of a year, actually. And because it's uh, kind of just another pattern and we didn't really have a, a tip, we're going to do a throwback tip. We got that from our buddy John Kraft, uh, that idea. But anyway, we're the Beaties from Boise, Idaho. And I guess you get to start this evening. Is that right? So I guess I, you better get in the, what, what do I want to call that, the hot seat? You bet. Let me get out of the way. I wouldn't the, want to, I wouldn't want to go in your way. Whatever it is. There you go. Well, to begin with, um, I was, oops, I'm out of the picture. I better screw over. Yeah. To begin with, I was not totally satisfied with how I ended up last week. I just, it wasn't just real smooth. I decided I needed to work on legs and come up with some better tips on these legs. So I spent a better part of a oh, couple of days messing around with legs. And I think I'm a little happier now uh, with how I'm doing them. So what I've done is I've tied a fly up to the point of putting the legs on. So I'm going to do a partial wiggler, and then I'll go to my bivisible, which is what I'm really supposed to be doing. So let's get this out of here. I'm going to do the vice for you. Okay. Uh, my thread. Put my glasses down. Okay, the first thing that I decided about this fly that I didn't really do last time was to set this wing a little better. So I'm going to go to the pole point and just do a little quick maneuver here to make sure that this wing is a little stronger when I start tying the hackle. So that's the first thing. Now I have to put on the legs, so we'll get some piece of rubber legs here. I tried a lot of the things and suggestions that people gave last week. Some of them were fine. Some of them I just couldn't make work. So what I've come up with is a couple of things. First of all, it's very critical that you leave when you have the, the diameter or the width, I guess it is, of this leg, I need to leave that much space between them for the hackle. Um, additionally, it is important not to have a great big, long, dangly piece of leg when you're getting ready to do the hackle. So what I have started doing is I take the leg and wrap it around my thread and I bring it around and set it. Now, interestingly enough, the tendency is to want to correct like this, but I found it's easier to control that back leg by moving the front leg. And then I'm going to come around here and set that one and I have those legs in place. What I've been doing then is just I take it down and trim it about to where the hook point is, like that. It's not quite even, but that's okay. We'll correct that later. The second thing is, is I put a nice bit of wraps here. I tried with the dubbing. But I had a tendency to get too much dubbing in here. So I just decided thread wraps would work for me. So now I'm going to do the second leg. Same way. I put my forefinger on the thread. Come around here and grab the tips. Bring it around to the top. And set it. Another thing I've discovered is 
if you are using real tight thread wraps, it's harder to adjust the legs. So I'm using snug, but not real tight wraps holding those legs in place. Now I have a decision to make. Do I want to put another one on? And I think I've got room. So I'm going to go. Today I was just doing two, but I think I better put three because I've got a little space left here. So same thing. Bring it around. Place it. I got too tight a wrap. See what it does when the wrap is tight? It just doesn't work. There we go. You loosen the wrap, then you can start placing your leg the way you want it. Whoop. There we go. And now I've got my legs in place. Trim that one off. Okay, I'm ready to do my hackle. Oh, what happened to, oh, there it is. We start with the, the other thing I determined, I tried and tried to, to wrap two hackles at once and it just doesn't work. So I just take one full wrap of this. And I'm gonna bring it over the top and between these two, take two wraps here. Now I'm going to do my second one. And I'm going to come from underneath with it. Now I'll do my, uh, push my dog, dog leg that hackle back in, trim it off. Do a whip finish. Then I find if I've got these loose enough, I'm able to straighten out a, a little bit and there we go. And I think that was just a little neater. It worked a little better. You can trim these all off now to equal each other. And uh, there's the wiggler. This, you look at this in the book and you think, oh boy, this is an easy fly. But remember that La Fontaine's flies are not always what you expect them to be. And they are messy. This is a messy fly to tie. I'm tying it in a size 12, one X hook. I'm using black thread. I tried at one point to change from black to white and then back to black. And it was just for a quick fly. It was just not worth my time. So I'm using brown hackle. And that's the body hackle and that's all the body is. And the front hackle is Antron in a dubbing loop. And then the head is thread. Now, the Antron that we use, let's go to the materials. Zelon body wool, Antron body wool, and it just doesn't work. What you really need is this stuff like this that is kind of crinkly. It, what we have is the stuff that Gary LaFontaine's um, book mailer used to put out. And of course, it's no longer available. But I, I checked some places online and you have to be really careful because some of it, when they say Antron dubbing, is really a mix of either nylon, wool, rayon, whatever, and Antron. And it doesn't work the same. The one place I found that online that looks like they really have got this stuff is um, Charlie's Fly Box. And that is in Colorado. He's online. 
and it actually says white, but it, it's the same as this. So if you want to try this, that's a good place to get that. And he's got a lot of colors in this. Um, and he does do a lot of Antron tying. So it's, it's, I'm not surprised that he's got this. I looked other places and it looked like to me, a lot of what they had was mixed. Hard to tell online. Uh, I mean, if you go in your local shop, you might find that that it is this stuff. I don't know. I'm using uh, some whiting dry fly hackle. This is from a 100 pack. And so they're all supposed to be 12s hooks. And that is it. And then I've got all my tools here. Um, I found um, that this worked the best for me. I've tried a dubbing whirl. I tried a lot of things. But working with the Antron, I need more control than I can get with a dubbing whirl. So we'll set this over here. That's what I'm going to use. I also found um, that it was best to, once I got it, the loop twisted, was to put it in hackle pliers. And this happens to be a pair of hackle pliers that hold but are weak enough so I can actually use them. Um, and then, of course, the whip finish tool. I found, and you're going to see spreading the hackle in the loop, I like to use my bodkin. And of course, I use my little uh, comb. Oh, and that, that brush thing too, I forgot to bring this over. This is a good thing to, to mess around with the, the stuff once it's on the hook to get it to look like you want it to. And this is my, I, about the right amount. I started using too much. And what you end up doing is crowding the, the fly and uh, it gets all out of balance. And so yeah, be sure to uh, not use too much. The other thing too is, is I had a tendency to have it too long in the dubbing loop and it would twist into itself. So, um, that's another thing you, to be aware of. And this is the roadmap. Let's put it right there. And as you can see, it's kind of a wild looking critter. I probably could trim that hackle a little bit or the antron a little bit more. It should be closer to the length of the hackle. Mm -hmm. Another thing that I find difficult is I find it easy to find the one half point on a fly on a hook. And I find it easy to find the one fourth position, but the one third has always been kind of a mystery to me. So what I've started doing is I locate the half, I kind of visualize where the one fourth is, and then I kind of go halfway between them. And that should be about one third. This is the easy part. Oh, another comment too. Gary tied this fly tying the tip in and for the life of me I cannot figure why it fishes the same it looks pretty much the same and for me it is so much easier to to tie in the butt end I know on a wet hackle it makes more difference but on this dry fly hackle I just can't see that it makes that much difference so I've got some bare stem here and just like always I'm going to leave a little bit of bare stem tie this on I'm going to stop right about there now I could leave the thread hanging here to make sure my wraps are close but instead what I do and I've done it for years is I just when I come around I come kind of at an angle and pull back. And that keeps my hackle wraps tight against each other. Another thing that sometimes happens when you're wrapping really tight hackle, you can see you can get some fibers that are sticking forward. And so when I see that happening, I just dress them back a little bit.
I'm going to tie this off. And I don't have to worry too much about the stem because uh, this is uh, not where the head is going to be, obviously. Okay, now I want to uh, make sure I get that stem down. There we go. It was sticking up just a bit. I didn't have enough trouble with the antron. I don't need stem in my way. Then I'm going to wrap forward and leave, make a stop about where I want my head to be. Now, the other thing is, if you make your dubbing loop tight against where your hackle ended, you're going to have a problem. It's better off to start your dubbing loop about in the middle of that one third point right here. The other thing is Antron is slippery. So I found it had a tendency to clump together as I twisted it. So I started using dubbing wax just to make it a little tackier and hopefully keep it where it belongs. So we'll put a little dubbing wax on our thread. Let's take a look at the Antron. As you can see, it's kind of wily. What I'm going to do here is take it out, and I like to clump it up like this, and then I'm going to trim it off on each end. So it's like this. So that's ready to go, and I'll set it down. Get my loop. I'm going to put my tying thread forward. Good. I'm going to set this on the bobbin wrist to get it out of my way. I wasn't doing that today when I was practicing because I didn't have a bobbin wrist on, wrist on mine. So we'll see if it gets in my way or not. But I was thinking today a bobbin wrist would be good. I just take this and set it right in here. Take my bodkin, just play with it a little bit here. I want it pretty sparse on the thread, as evenly distributed as I can get it. I'm watching it to make sure that it doesn't get all tangled within itself. It has a tendency to do that, and as you can see right here, here's what I'm looking for. So I just reach in here and correct that. Now you don't need to do a lot of twisting. That is probably good enough right there. So I'll take my uh, pliers. Let's start wrapping that. I don't want to fool around with it too long. Probably mess it up if I do. I want to dress this back with each turn. Bob and rest out of the way. It was kind of impeding my movements. Yeah, oh, come on, let's get that cut. There we go. Now I'm going to whip finish. This fly, Gary used his, I guess, yo-yo method, you'd call it, on ponds and, and lakes. And what he would do is get the um, wind to his back and he, by the way, he would take his tippet leader off and put on uh, dental floss. And the thing, and then he gets with the wind to his back and holds the, the rod tip up. The fly flies out in the wind as he drops his the tip of his rod. Then it, uh, of course, hits the water and floats. 
Yeah, and that was called the blow line technique, not the the yo yo technique. Oh, that, another that's one. right, the blow line. Okay. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Now let's trim this a little bit. Okay, I think that's fairly even. All right, that's our bi visible. Antron by visible. Any questions, anybody? It looks very, very simple, which is so encouraging for those of us who are new. <laughs> the Antron is tricky, but if you follow some of the things that I talked about in that don't you try to get too much and cut it off so it's not real long, um, don't twist it too much. I think, and you need to keep tension on on it as you're twisting it. Um, I think it's it can be easy. Thank you. Is this a, an attractor fly or just it could be anything fly? Yeah, it's an attractor fly. Um, when Al originally did a bi visible or a bi color, wasn't it called in the early times? You were using a wet hackle, weren't you, and sinking it. And then he, we, he, back in the day, he started using a dry fly tackle. Mm -hmm. And so it, it is a dry fly attractor when you do it that way. Right. And, so I, you know, it isn't good for all occasions, but there are some times that it just seems to excite the fish. I guess that's the best way to put it. Particularly when, when you use that La Fontaine technique of letting it, letting the rod tip raise it into the wind, it would lift it off the water and it would flutter around and bring the rod tip down and it would bring it to the water. And basically you're, you're doing some long distance dapping. If you know what dapping is, dapping is bouncing the fly up and down on the water. But with nothing else, we'll move on to the next pattern. While you're looking at the recipe, I'll chat about it a little bit and I'll tell you about the history of the fly while I move some of the materials that Gretchen has in the materials area out of the way and I move mine in place. But this is called the dirty rat. I did not originate it. It was originated by a, uh, a dear friend of mine named Don Richards. And the story goes, well, goes like this. Uh, this buddy and I, Bob Lay, would travel to the Bighorn River every year, the second week of September, for the Black Caddis Hatch. And we'd stay a week. We had a, had a cabin down there and <clears throat> just... Thought it was pretty great. And every now and then, the different Federation fly tires that we would would work with uh, would say, hey, could we come down and join you? And, yep, no problem. Come on down, join us. Well, one year, uh, Don Richards, it was his first year tying at the Conclave, and he was pretty pleased about that. And, and anyway, he uh, asked if he could come down and join us. Well, as it turned out that particular week, Bob and I arrived on a Wednesday night late, so we didn't get on the water until Thursday, and Don didn't arrive until he got off work on Friday evening, so it was late in the evening. We'd been on the water for two days when, when Don arrived, and um, we had not touched the fish, and on the bighorn, that's very, very unusual that that, that was the case, and we were pretty, we were feeling pretty sorry for ourselves because, you know, it just not one of those things that we're used to taking that kind of a whipping because we're pretty good anglers. And um, we'd been to the Big Horn a whole bunch of times and never been whipped. Two days. Don shows up and we all get a jump in the, in the drift boat the next morning. That's the, the third day. We're halfway through the morning. We still haven't touched the darn fish. And Don is catching fish just one after the other after the other. What is that dirty rat doing with over there, Bob says? I don't know. I don't know. So we, we hollered across the river, Eddie, because he was on the other side of the river at the time. He says, well, I'm just using this little parachute fly. It's a, it's nothing. It, it's a real, real simple fly. Okay. Well, finally, by the middle of the afternoon, we were still fishless. And Don was, was catching fish, you know, an average of one every 15, 20 minutes. Could not figure out what he was doing. I mean, you know, I, I always believed that the fly pattern didn't always make that much difference. Well, it was when I started to rethink that thought. So anyway, we got together for a late lunch, and he showed us the fly. And uh, 
I'm getting ready to show you the roadmap fly right now because we're going to kind of tie it. And I apologize. I've been leading up on this thing. Is uh, It's my number one dry fly in my personal fly box. And uh, you're going to be disappointed when you see it. Because there it is. It is nothing but a peacock body, a parachute hackle, and a wing post tied in sizes. I do it. Uh, I got a few tens. Most of the stuff that I fish are in the 14 to 20 range. And I do it in a peacock body. And I do it as uh, and uh, Tan, uh, olive green, brown, black, and gray are the colors that I carry. And I have one complete box of with nothing but dirty rats in it. Now, I want you to understand the guy's name that developed it was Don Richards and Dirty Rat kind of go together. And you can throw whatever expletive, expletive you want in front of Dirty Rat when Bob was referring to him as being the guy that didn't share it with us sooner. Anyway, Bottom line is, after Don gave us a couple of flies, we were catching fish for the rest of the week. And I, I just could not believe that a fly would make that much difference. I just, I still have a hard time with it. And this is like 30 years later, but it's still a number one fly. But number one dry fly, excuse me, or whatever you want it to be, because it can, it can be just about anything. But let's tie this. It's a, an incredibly simple fly. And we'll start by taking a look at the materials we got. It shouldn't be any surprise for you what they are. And let's get my camera adjusted here. I got the other camera on the tank in. There we go. That's a little bit better. I'm going to be using calf tail. Uh, the Antron wool will be used later when we do the, the new pattern that we've been, it's been in development. I'll get my glasses. Take my thread and put it over here. And we'll get this out of the way. We'll have that. I've got hackle right here. I'll grab that in a few minutes when I need it. And let's just get back to the to the vise, and I'll put a hook in the vise, and we'll go from there. And I'll start my thread base <clears throat> right here, back about one third back from the hook eye. And I'm just going to wrap that part of, the, part of the way to the back of the hook. And not quite all the way, maybe down to the point and then right back to my starting point. Now let's slip over here to the materials. And I'll grab a bundle of this calf tail. And I don't want to... Calf tail is just like any other hair. I don't care what hair you're using. You've got stuff that you need to throw away. And stuff that you that you need to uh, hang on to. All, all ha hair is basically in multiple layers. You've got a, the really long hair, like this right here. We'll call that layer one. And right below that is what we call layer two. And below that is three, four, and crud. All the stuff that we want to get rid of. Now, usually run my finger up and down rapidly like this to get rid of the, the material and knock it out of there so that I don't, don't generate static electricity. And I'm gonna do that not in front of the camera where it'll make a mess all over my lens, but I'm gonna slip down over the waste bin and get rid of that. Okay, now I'm back. And what we have left now is that, one of the things about calf tail, there's a certain part of the tail where the Layer one and the layer two, there's a, a big difference between them. And what I usually do is I'll hand stack that by pulling layer one out and putting layer two up on top of it. And all that does is just kind of even things up a little bit so my stacker can do a better job. And I'll just trim that off. And grab my homemade stacker. And to anybody that's new, just, just checking in, they are not for sale. And I'm just going to take the stacked hair out of the stacker, pointing in the direction that it goes on the hook. And in this case, with the tips pointing to the right. Now, there's a couple of wild ones in it. It still didn't stack real good, but you know what? I think you guys get the idea. I'll pull a couple of the wild ones out of here. That's a little bit better. And I'll measure it for length. Set it in place and tighten that up. 
and I'll wrap part of the way back. And now I'm going to trim at a severe angle, just like I do when I'm trying to blend it into a tail. But this will taper the body to the back of the hook. See how that tapers that in place right there? And what I'm going to do now is move forward. And I got lucky, but I'm going to move back here anyway. I, right back here, several turns back from the from the base of the wing is what I call a pull point. What I'm going to do is bring this hair up so that it is... I got one hair that's come that's crossed underneath that I don't want to have it crossed underneath. There we go. So what I'm going to do now is you're watching there. I'm going to pull all that hair up so it doesn't sneak down around the bottom of the hook and bring a loop of thread around there and go back to my pull point, which is further back on the hook shank. We went through that quite a bit last week. Anyway, that is going to stand that up just fine. I'm going to go ahead and wrap a thread dam in front that will make that stand up a little bit more okay and i'm going to wrap around my parachute post and i'm going to go up the post and i do it by going down by flipping the things over because i've got some messed up shoulders and i just can't raise my arm to wrap up the parachute post so i'll wrap up the post by going down just like i'm doing right there And I'll uh, make a few turns the other direction. I want you to notice that I'm adding some strands of up and down thread to the round and around thread that I make. Notice that I went from the top of that post straight to the hook shank. That's because that uh, up and those up and down strands with the round and around strands act like rebar and concrete. And I'm just going to leave that there for right now and and get a. Uh, Hackle out here. Let's see. Back over here, I've pulled. I've got some hackles that are all sized for the size that I want, and I think I'll just do grizzly. I better use that. That almost never happens. I'll just uh, tie that uh, to the hook right there in front of the post, and I'm going to again wrap up the post, but this time. I'll be binding the stem of the hackle to the post as I wrap towards the top. All right, just let that hang out there like that. Now it's time for the peacock. Back over to the materials. And let's see here. I'll just grab about three of those and there's, there's a whole bunch of them there that I grabbed, but there's only about three or four that I'm gonna use and the rest of them there's a broken one here that all it's going to do is break when I go to wrap it. There's a short one. I don't want it. And we're down to three. That's good. I'll just trim the curlies off of this end. And flip it around. And tie the tip end right up here at front. At the front. Now, one of the things that I want to do is just take a couple of wraps right here in front of the wing until I get behind the wing. And now I want to, what I did is I kind of got a few wraps of thread around that in front here so that it's strengthened. And now I'm going to use a reversed Dutch Bachman technique, which is using the weight of the, the spool of thread and the bobbin holder to wrap my peacock to the back of the hook. And I'll just keep going until I get to the to the back of the shank. You see how it's just pulling that thread there right along, right along with the with the turns, and it makes a pretty decent application of of your peacock. Now I'm going to go ahead and tie that off with several turns. And if you don't remember it, one of the things that it shows on the recipe is that we wrap a tag using thread. Whatever color thread I'm using to tie the fly will be the color of the tag back here. And then we'll glue it and all that kind of stuff. But right now we're just, uh, one of the things that I found that it's a lot easier if I kind of rotate the 
the the vice so that the hook is mostly upside down, and I have an easier time wrapping that tag in in that direction, just like I'm doing right there. And with that hackle flopping around there, if I pause slightly as I come around each turn, it will kick loose. And the reason that I do this, let me stop for a second. I've got another fly here. Same thing tied with red, green, whatever colors you want. And I'm, I often talk about the LaFontaine theory of attraction. Well, guess what colors we use where? If it's a, if, if it's just going to be a standard um, fly, we'll use black, green in the alpine forests of central Idaho, uh, red or orange in the reddish colored desert country in uh, along the Gunnison River. We've also got some uh, peacock that's been overdyed a little bit with red, which goes really good with the red. Goes very, very good. But I want you to notice, and I don't even know if while I was talking, if you noticed, but I was ribbing forward over that peacock, further strengthening it with my thread rib. Now, I want you to notice that the, the uh, thread is hanging at the back of the of the of the of the wing post. I'm going to start wrapping down each turn getting closer to my thread waiting for it there at the shank. Now we'll bring this around and pull down and I am going to chase the hackle if you will with the thread. I've anchored the feather to the post right there one turn. And now what I'm going to do I'm going to tilt this so you can see it just a little bit better. I'm going to pull it up this time, come around another time, come under that feather so that I've anchored it from two directions. And now I'm going to trim off the waist and then come around one more time, tucking that trimmed off piece up and under. And then I'm going to come forward and apply a whip finish and a, a half, half hitch and a whip finish. Starting with a half hitch and a second. And I'll do a three turn whip finish using the same tool. And it will be a three turn whip finish if you allow it to collapse over the central core thread. If you pull it hard and fast, it'll be a three turn jam knot. So it's kind of important that you pull it the way that it's uh, going to be a whip finish rather than a jam knot. However, the jam knot holds really good too. Now, I'll trim that off. And what you've got there is one of the deadliest flies. Talk about how you would glue it. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. What I'm going to do is tilt this, and I'm going to use this great stuff that, again, Dutch Bachman turned this on to. It's a product called Healthy Hoof. It's from the horse industry for polishing Horses feet. But when you're doing horses feet, you don't get it in this size, you get it in five gallon sizes. But anyway, but it works really well for tying flies. And I'll just let that drop right down in the, the glue is running right down that. And into the hackle and that glues it right there. So I got a, a couple of spots there that I want to get rid of before it dries on me. But anyhow, that is your dirty rat all glued and ready to go to the water. I'm going to go right into another pattern here real quick. And let me show you the new emerger that we've been playing with. And now, this is in a size 12, and I visualize it in tying it and using it in... Um, Probably a lot, a lot, a lot smaller sizes than than twelve. However, anyway, there's there it is, our purpose particular fly, and coming up with a pattern. It's let's just say it's been a couple of years in the making, and John Kareft has um, helped a lot, whether he realizes it or realizes it or not. And let me let me show you how that ha that has come about. Okay, now this is a, a slide. We call it cripples in craft photos. And there's one of John's photos that um, has a bunch of bunch of flies in the uh, uh, in in the water. 
Next one coming up. Now there's a, there's the next slide coming up, and that's a little tighter shot. I want you to notice that the there seems to be a mix of bugs. John could probably chime in as to what I'm looking at, but it looks to me like I'm looking at some dark-bodied mayflies and some light olive mayflies and probably something else in there too. Yeah, I would say that there's a, it was a PMD and a Stenigmula hatch along with some betas on our river. Sometimes the PMDs are more of a, um, a March brown color. And if you notice the eyes, um, I think the males have the the rusty eyes and the females uh -huh. don't. So yeah. you'll see differences in that. But what I really enjoy of that first slide that you put up is that some of those mayflies seem to be just hitching a ride going down the river on that leaf. Aren't they though? <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> this is just a, an example of a cripple. And, um, but I want you to notice that Often when we think of cripple, we think of a partly hatched mayfly that didn't quite, quite kind of got stuck in the shuck. And here's one that's obviously it's a cripple, but it looks like it's in the adult form, but it isn't going anywhere. It's stuck. And before I go into the next part, which is really the 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 cripple, the part of the cripple that I want to talk about, I just want to thank John, Riverkeeper Flies. Uh, that's his website. And I'm Highly recommend you drop in there, look around, and you won't be disappointed. And he's sure been good to us in sharing all these um, all these photographs with us over the last weeks. This next thing is a cobbled Cal, together. Yes, Cal. If I can make one more brief comment on that oh, middle yeah. on that middle picture, you'll yeah. notice that some of the bodies of those bugs are submerged, so the wings are holding them up. But these are, are all bugs that I found in an eddy. So they've just been swirling around. So some of them are uh, partially submerged. You actually, that's a seg perfect segue into what is going to happen next. Because the next thing is a drawing that I cobbled together from stuff that I took off of the internet, I added to myself, and you'll see what I'm talking about here in a minute. But um, I cobbled this together, and the dark black line is the water level. This is a bug that's part of, part of the way out of the shuck, which is going to be trigger points. And I think the, the fish key based on trigger points and, and what triggers them, I don't know. Gary talked about this at length, about trigger points and what he would think they were uh, based on diving underwater. Well, I don't dive underwater, but what I do know about this particular bug and the bugs that John pointed out to us in that middle slide is that they're partly submerged. There's some of the fly that's above the water, some of the fly that's below the water, some of the fly in the some of the flies in the surface film. And what I wanted what I'd like to do now is to let's break this into pieces. My make believe fly is in red. And you can see I'm a real artist. I'd no wise ask comments out there, please. But anyway, what I've done though is I've taken, taken the, um, the shuck, and that's definitely a below-the-water feature. Uh, the, the bug itself, the part that's ab above the water, is an above-the-water feature often, and the, uh, the fish will, will see that, I think, maybe more as a silhouette against the sky, where the shuck is right there in their world. And then coming down to the, to the legs, the legs can be below the water in the surface film, or as you saw uh, on the uh, drawing to the left, even above the water uh, as the bug comes out of the shuck. So the outlined in red is the kind of wild idea that, I, that, I, that I've come up with for, for this emerger. And here's the recipe for it. And we call it the KZ merger for a working title until it, ends up with some kind of a some kind of a title we'll call it the KZ merger and um, as you can see we use a, a scud or a dry fly hook and it can be sizes 6 to 20 I'll tie it tonight in a size 12 however some of the other flies that I've tied uh, the last couple of days uh, uh, I think it probably a size is uh, 
14s through 18s is probably going to be more appropriate. But it depends, you know, if you're doing green drakes, uh, a size 12 would probably be very appropriate. The tail is antron fibers, and the back is deer hair, but it could also be CDC or poly. The small ones I did that I tied today were in poly, and I don't know what I did with them. They're not here right now. The hackle is going to be, it's going to be hackle. It could be soft, whatever. And I'm questioning whether it needs to be there or not. That's something I'm going to want feedback from you all as, as the time unfolds. And the body, body could be dubbing, peacock or choice. I'm going to do peacock because I got peacock laying here. And the wing or the tail, whatever you want to call it, will be waist from the folded over back. Let's take this out of the vise and get started tying it. And the first thing that we want to do is I want you to notice that the, the tail. In fact, let me leave this one in the vise. I'm going to want your feedback on something here in a few minutes after I've finished tying. We're going to talk about it. Here's one type of tail that I, that I tried tying. And here's the other. I don't know which would be the, be would be the better. I, I, I like the one to the left. Um, I don't know. I, the other one would probably just look about the same once it got wet and was below the surface of the water anyway. I don't know, but it's just a thought. You know, it's, a, it's easier, but I'm going to show you how to tie that one, how to come up with a shuck that's shaped like that, and then you decide what you want to do with it. But the first thing I need to do, let's go over to the materials. And I've got my Antron body wall. And I'm just going to cut a chunk of that off. And I've, I found that a piece about as long as the fold over, you notice how this is a, folded over here. And every time it goes over the edge of the cardboard, there's a fold over point. Well, you can either straighten that out with a hair dryer, like I showed you last week. Or you can just use that as a kind of a measurement and cutoff point. And I'll just cut that off right now and then go back to the vise. Okay. okay, and I'm going to grab my, my handy dandy long plunge tool. Okay, there we go. I've got that, got that anchor just like that. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to get my flashlight, which is the UV light and the UV glue. And I'll just open that up and have it all ready for me. I'm going to hold this out here like this and rotate my vise to twist this up nice and tight. That looks pretty good. Now I'm just going to switch this around here and hold that out in front with my left hand while I take the UV glue and just kind of soak up the middle here. Okay, good. I'll just set that aside. Now I'll turn on my UV light and give it a, a couple of blasts of light. Okay, just set the light. Now what I'm going to do is this is all nice and hard and dried. I'm going to cut that right in the middle. So that's one shuck, and this is the other shuck, and then I'll trim it to the, to the way I want it after I get it on the hook. But for now, I'm just going to take that out, set it aside, and get a scud hook and put it in the in the vise. However, it could be a dry fly hook too. I just have chosen to use scud because I think it does a good job of putting part of the fly below the water surface. And what I'll do right here is um, just start my thread right at the front. <clears throat> And in the interest of saving a little bit of time, I'm just going to go ahead and bind this shuck material right to the bear hook as I wind my thread on. And that's going to be, looks about like the way I want it. All right, there we go. And just come back forward. And I'll bring my thread all the way to the hook eye. Reach over and get a half hitch tool. Throw a half hitch in there so I don't bump it accidentally and knock everything off. Now I'm going back to the materials. Cut off a small bundle of this uh, deer hair. And back of the vise. 
I want to show you a problem with that deer hair. You see how it's curved? It's not straight. It won't stack very good. And uh, and I and I picked this hair for the for the reason that uh, it doesn't make any difference because you can straighten it. What you do is you take your thumbnail and your forefinger of your left hand, and just like a lot of salmon fly tires do to reshape a golden pheasant crest over the top of the fly, you put a series of crimps in the curved side to straighten it out. <laughs> now, remember, all hair has uh, layers one, two, and three, and what the stuff you want to get rid of. Here's layers one. Here's layers two. And everything from here on is junk. I'm going to get rid of the junk out over the trash can. I'll be right back. And now we've got uh, just layers one and two, and all the trash is gone. So we can stack that and use it and, and probably not have too much trouble with it. Every now and then there'll be one, one hair that wants to go wild on you. That's because you messed up and didn't get all of layers three or four out of there. And though it looks the same, it has different properties because of where it's positioned in the in the animal. And uh, it's more hollow and has more flair to it. So if you have a hair that goes wild on you and all the rest of them are being hay, there's a good chance that it's just you missed getting rid of one. Let's um, take that out of the stacker, pointing in the direction that we're going to use it. And I've got a few more fibers than I want. I'll get rid of some of those. And let's measure that for length. And I want that to be a, just slightly longer than the hook. All right. Find that right in the place. I'm using some really tight wraps as I work my way back. And you can see that's got some really tight wraps in there. Now, I want you to notice a, a problem that I'm going to have to deal with. Okay, I just cut all that off. And you see that stub there? Let me again come in close, take a close look at that. I'll guarantee you, you're a better person than I am if you can just grab your bobbin and start wrapping and not end up with the stuff getting hung up under your thread. Well, there's a trick I'm going to show you that gives you at least an 80% chance of getting wrapped up and over that. And what, I'm, what I do is I take the pinch of my finger right up here, and I want you to notice, uh, first off, on the near side, I have my, my thumbnail. Now, I'm keeping it back just slightly from where it needs to be. And on the other side is the edge of my trigger finger. Well, I'm going to roll that trigger finger into position the way it needs to be so that that side lines up right with the edge of that flared hair. And now I'm going to bring the thumbnail in. And what the two, the wrapping against the finger rather than up against that hair and gradually moving my hand back allows me to capture all of that hair there without having a big wadded up mess sticking out all over the place. Now I've got, I've got two hairs where I would have had a lot more had I not used that technique. Like I said, it's about 80%. Okay, now remember, I, I want to make sure that this hair is on top. So I'm at the pull point here. Bring that under and make sure that hair is on top of the hook shank. All right. <clears throat> and now we're going to get another couple of strands of peacock. Again, it could just as easily be dubbing. could be a some yarn. I mean, whatever you want it to be, this is not um, a must-have peacock type of a, of a situation. This is, um, is a fly that we're going to build from. And I'm just going to make a couple of turns right here, thread and, and the uh, peacock. And now, again, we're going to use the reverse Bachman method of using the weight of the spool, thread, bobbin to go to the back, holding that nicely in place. 
and now it's time to come back forward. And I am going to rib over that almost back to my starting point right there. I'm going to stop. So that's got that peacock strengthened. Now I'm going to pull the bundle of hair up and over. And remember, I can pull it fairly tight, but if you want it to be real tight, you've got to push it tight. See the difference there? It tightens it right up just by relaxing with the left hand and tightening with the right. And now I'll go ahead and bind that in place. And I'll reach over here. And I want to try something that I've been playing with for the last few days. I'm going to see if I can flash back and forth between my tools and my work camera. And I don't know what, why I want to do that, but it's just one of those fun things I like to play around with. Anyway, we'll get that all tied off. There we go. Put that back in place. Now let's go back to just cameras. And we'll trim that off. Well, no, I don't want to trim that off yet. I have to put on some hackle. That's what I'm not sure that we even need. But what I what I don't know is I want legs. I'm thinking I could pull some of the wing material forward and throw a, a loop of, of thread in there and, and, and make some legs. I, I haven't done that yet. I just had that thought this How evening. How would that respond in the water? I don't know. Because I don't know what it would do. Don't know, don't know what it would do. And yeah. So... Uh, the other thing I'm going to do is I'm just what I what I have in the um, in the sample fly is I'm just going to go ahead and put some a couple of turns of hackle on. So I was just wondering, doesn't the hackle look like legs still? Yes, it does. And, and uh, in place of the hackle uh, would be the thing that I'm thinking about. And yes, it does look like legs and. Uh, I'm trimming it off the bottom, pulling in this up to the side. And that'll give you the footprint that you'd see on the water. And uh, I think that would be fine, but I'm also not opposed to the thought of pulling maybe the wing down and making legs out of that, or maybe it doesn't need legs at all. I just have no idea. But Questions, comments, tell, tell me I'm crazy, whatever. You've seen how it goes together. What I would like is some help from people like Chuck, John, Lou, over, Sherry Steele, folks over in the sisters area, the guys in Nebraska, the guys in Texas, you know, uh, Rick, Rick uh, in uh, Montana. Anyway, uh, do me a favor. Just tie one or two of these. And give it a test drive. When when you get back on the water and you've got um, emerging insects, and see what see what it does for you. Question: Were you going to trim that? Uh, I just I just remembered that I hadn't done. Yeah. It. Yeah. Somebody is somebody is a mind reader around here, but I'm going to trim this. And that's even a little bit long, so let me get out, cut off some more. There we go. Yeah, and. Yeah. Now it's more the way I would think it should be. And tonight's tip, we're going to be talking about melted eyes. What does a truck have to do with melted eyes? Oh, this is your throwback. Yeah, this is my throwback. Yes, it is. <laughs> and uh, you're going to find out right now what a truck has to do um, with melted eyes. And in fact, oh, when we come back, what I'm holding here, is a mud flap yeah. from a truck. It's also the same kind of mud flap that's used on RVs and stuff like that. But this is a mud flap that um, goes on, on trucks. And I have cut one of these fibers off of here, and it's something different than monofilament, like the regular monofilament fishing line that we try to make our melted eyes out of. This stuff makes perfect eyes. And I've also found a couple of brooms that I have in the garage that have the same kind of stuff only it's a lot thinner but it's the same density whatever it is and i want to show you how this stuff will form an eye it is we found just... that in a parking lot when we were at the well, we fly were... fishing show in denver that's right i took the dog for a walk along the railroad tracks and there was a on the other side of the railroad tracks was a was a, a big parking lot for a trucking company and 
the truck had either the guy had either thrown it out there or lost it. One of the two. Anyhow, <clears throat> and can you imagine how many flies that, or how many eyes that would make? Oh Jesus! Well, anyway, oh. what I've done is I've got a piece of that mono, that monofilament from the um, from the uh, um, mud guard, and I'm going to come back over to the vice now. And Sherry, you may want this fly later, so I better get it out of the vice before I end up using this and having it go poof. But what I want you to, what I want you to watch is how what a nice eye this thing makes. I want you to see how nice and round and shiny that is and black. You don't have to paint it. It's already black. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hold it in a tweezers. Oh, I love this. <laughs> now, doesn't that make just a, a dynamite-looking, shiny, nice round eye? Well, anyway, let's move on to the next thing, which is a hey, sharing on BT's Fly Tying Friday. And this is the part of the show when we bring all of you into the to share with us what you have to share. And we're going to start tonight, Bill Clumper who has a tip very very dry fingernails and they start getting all cracked and everything else and then they get rough on top so then i'm starting to you know snag you know like the 70 denier and the very fine threads so i found this sally hansen's repair rescue oh. is great to put over the top of your fingernails and along the leading edge how bright and shiny that is now linda miller contacted us linda yeah, that's right. Um, this is an emerger pattern that uh, uh, I tried after watching Dick Rawbaugh's presentation on Fly Tying Fridays, and he referenced the uh, the fly, the spotlight, and looked that I looked that one up, and it is very similar to Fox's Poopa, which it, but was designed by Tim Fox out of the fly shop in Reading. No, where is it? Oh, here you go. It's on a clean camera hook with a, and the critical elements I think of this spotlight and Fox's pupa is having a mylar wrapped around the hook, the chenille as part of the emerger. And then I added um, a wing based on what Dick Robot. So I went to the Hobby Lobby today to get some stretchy cord for another ply pattern. I found this stuff. It's goose biots, already mm. stripped and dyed. So you, it came in three different packs, a buck each, and you get about mm. six or seven of these goose biots, and they're already prepared for you. And this came from Jim Ferguson and Kathy Hamilton a little over a year ago. And I want you to recall when I had that really tight spot that I had to position my fingers a certain way to get the thread to lay in, and capture the trimmed butts of the of the hair on this last fly that we tied. I guarantee you, had I not used this product, you'll see it up close here in just a moment. Had I not used this product, that wouldn't have happened because right now in the winter time around here, shoveling snow and all that kind of junk, my hands are cracked and they're a mess all the time. If it wasn't for this, and this is called Thread Magic. You get it from Amazon, and I'll just pull the lid off of this. And what you have in there is kind of a hard wax type stuff that you just stroke it over your fingers and it takes all those rough edges and turns it into glass. It's just slippery and as nice as can be. And that just allowed that thread to slip over my fingers without snagging where it would have snagged had I not been using thread magic. So my recommendation to all of you is Hey, that's it for this Friday. For now, it's a wrap until next Friday. Please join us again next week when, well, you'll have to join us to find out what we have going on. Thanks for being here.